Ten o'clock found the traveller and myself leaving for the Rue d'Arrue. We spoke in whispers, for I think both of us were apprehensive that at the last moment Mademoiselle Lavisse would emerge from her room and forbid me to be out so late, even in such devout circumstances. The symbolism of the Russian Orthodox Easter service is profoundly moving. Just before midnight, the church doors swung open, and in a flood of colour and candlelight, the glittering procession emerged to circle the building three times, chanting. At last, with measured tread, grave in their joy, they re-entered the church, there to announce to the waiting throng that Christ was risen. We heard a sudden burst of singing, rapturous music, and the bells rang out overhead. Christos vos Christ! Christ is risen. The crowds joined in the great cry, crossing themselves, prostrating themselves, kissing each other, friends and strangers, each saluted with the triple kisses of the Trinity. The traveller and I exchanged such kisses, but as he kissed me, his basalt dark stare clouded. He held me close, kissing me once again, before turning away, pushing me from him roughly. Gradually the streets emptied, and the quarter resumed its habitual quiet. The traveller had been silent, leaning against the railings, his coat collar turned up, his slit eyes staring at nothingness. In the old days, he shrugged, we should have been caught up in some frightful gathering. But gone to the gypsies later, I prompted. Are you mad? The Tsigane on Easter night? They were for other nights. Easter was something quite apart. In Holy Russia, we took Easter seriously. Why, no one even made love to their own wives, let alone anyone else's in Holy Week. His face darkened. Bed for you, miss, he snapped, and hailed a passing taxi. As we drove through the empty streets, he glowered ahead, the slit eyes like dark thread. Abruptly, his face changed, lit by one of his most delightfully malicious smiles. There are a few of our Ciganes here, you know. They came in from the Balkans. They won't be keeping Easter, except as good business. I think we'll go and find out what they're doing. Shall we? We? I wondered how Mademoiselle would view this further excursion. It's educational, he replied and giving the taxi driver, a fellow Russian, an address in Passy, we rattled off to perdition. In my imagination, the Tsigane were a tawny band of savages, dancing fiercely round the campfires, strumming guitars, stretched on bearskins, loving wildly but chastely, nobly, holding proudly to their tribal laws. If, however, they were what I thought of as the indoor kind, then, although equally tawny and savage, their setting was some crimson and gold restaurant, all mirrors and chandeliers. It was inevitable, then, that the unpretentious nightclub at which we now arrived should seem an anticlimax. I had never been to one before, and I stumbled across the small, darkened room with a faint sense of disappointment. The traveller ordered Blini for both of us, and warned the waiter to reserve me a double portion of Pashka, which he knew with prophetic accuracy would be my favourite food for evermore. Vodka and champagne now materialised. But no vodka for you, miss, he said, downing several tiny glasses in rapid succession and making short work of some piroshki. How do you find the champagne? he asked, his tone implying that I was at least knowledgeable, if not a connoisseur, instead of tasting it for the first time as he very well knew. The Tsiganes were filing in and taking their places on a bench against the wall. They bore no resemblance to the wild creatures I had imagined. There were no bearskins, no tambourines, no gaudy kerchiefs. The women wore shawls over their dresses. The men were unshaven, without collars, in dark everyday suits, entirely without magic, I thought, until I became aware of a compelling animal force beneath the sullen mask. The Russians in the room were now applauding their arrival and crying out for the songs they wanted to hear. A very tall Tsigane, with a shock of grizzled hair, suddenly came to life, and picking up his guitar, began to sing on a long, drawn-out, howling cry, which cut across the smoke-filled room like a whiplash. 
With that one note, the desolation of the steps and the sound of a lone wolf in the forest closed round us, silencing the supper table chatter. I shivered, terror and pleasure struggling for place. Ten minutes to four, said the phosphorescent dial of a waiter's wristwatch as he settled another bottle of champagne into its ice bucket. I realised with pride that I had never stayed up so late before. The traveller was silent, listening raptly as if drugged. From time to time he roused himself and threw me a crumb of companionship or explanation. Russian enough for you here? Listen, this is one of their most famous old songs. You kissed my dark shoulders and I loved you forevermore. Mm, no doubt she did. Not everyone admired a sunburnt skin when that was written. Your sort of sugar icing was much more a la mode then. I think I shall call you Rothopi. It's Greek. Rothopis. Rose-fleshed. It was the first time anyone had ever made an allusion to my flesh, and I was overwhelmed. Growing up, I thought, offered the most fascinating possibilities. The choir sang on, gathering momentum, intoxicated by their own rhythms. Tragic, desperately gay or haunting, they sang of the troika which carried the lover to his mistress through a snowstorm. They sang of love stronger than fire or the sun, of the dark forest and the sleeping camp, of betrayals and partings. Karma Matu, said the traveller abruptly, raising his glass to me and smiling his sly, teasing smile when I looked blank. Kama Matu, that's Sigane talk, my little stupid Ichka. And if you were more of a linguist, you'd know what it means. Or more of a woman, he might have added. Kama Matu, I love you. Perhaps it was the fabled spell of Sigane music, but that night had, I think, decided both of us. He to seduce me, I to be seduced by him. Looking back, I consider the traveller acted disgracefully, abusing every canon of honour. He not only seduced a minor, but the daughter of old friends who had entrusted her to his care while abroad. Yet neither of us had the slightest qualm, nor were we ever found out. The traveller conducted the whole affair with what was, I suspect, practised care. We were walking dreamily along the empty, rain-washed streets towards my hotel, when he stopped, swinging me round, looking at me in his curious, intent manner, reaching and reading my mind behind my eyes. Puss in Kamayar, do you want me to love you properly? Improperly, I should say. You mean, what else do you think I mean, stupid Ichka? He was kissing me now, wooing kisses, but I was already one, undone. And don't start asking what Mademoiselle Lavis would say. She'd be speechless. I, too, was without words. My dream and my wish, the core of all my romantic longings, was suddenly before me, waiting to be fulfilled. Now I was not sure what I wanted, what I felt, except that the street and the sky and my head spun dizzily. Gradually, they spun slower and came to a standstill and I found myself walking along the same street once more. But it should have been a Russian street. I sighed, thinking of my old fantasy, the Trans-Siberian honeymoon. A traveller read my sigh. Yes, I know. You want us to be in our train. But that's impossible. Wait, though. You've given me an idea. He looked at his watch. Six o'clock. I can't imagine what sort can be running at this hour, nor where they are going. One thing is certain. I absolutely refuse to ruin you on a workman's train. Oh, puss in Gamayar, my angel child, if only you knew how wonderful it is to steal a march on time. You ought to be older. I ought to be younger. Don't be. We've won. We've tricked time. To Siberia. He pushed me into a passing taxi and told the driver to go to the Gare de Lyon via the Rue de l'Arcade. For my luggage? 
I was clutching at straws now, swept along by the racing tides of my desires. Don't be ridiculous. We're not eloping. And you don't need clothes for this sort of thing. On the contrary. I'm going to leave a message for Mademoiselle Lavis. What on earth are you going to tell her? Quite simple. That we left early for a day in the country with old friends I met at the cathedral last night. We didn't want to disturb her so early. You'll see. It will work out perfectly. And so it did. We caught a rapide to Dijon, which was almost empty. And soon, with a rustle of a lavish tip, the controller was persuaded to lock us in our compartment. The traveller snapped down the blinds in a business-like manner. We are in the Trans-Siberian, he announced with finality, and set out to convince me. My childish imaginings merged with the present, the urgent, brutal and obsessive kingdom of the flesh which was now revealed to me. There were no more hesitations, no doubts, nor any terrors, only loving, only happiness. The traveller reached out and jerked up the blind of an outside window. The Chinese yellow head came closer. The slit eyes stared down as inscrutable as ever, but the harsh voice was soft. So, how do you like being ruined in a rapid, my funny little nursery traveller? Don't bother to tell me. You look remarkably happy. But then, you never did have any sense of moral values. That and a good digestion are two of your most endearing qualities. Now get dressed, quickly. We're almost there. We scrambled for respectability. As the traveller fought with his tie and I groped under the seat for a stocking, I saw the sidelong eyes turned on me with a particularly sly gleam. You know, he said ruminatively, I always liked that bit in your great Duke of Marlborough's journal when he returns from the wars and rushes at the Duchess Sarah. Pleasured my lady twice with my boots on. It's so perfectly expressive of how one wants a woman. Women are different. They waste a lot of time subjecting their desires and ours to the setting and their appearance. Come here, Pusinka. Come here, this instant. I want you now. 